Good evening. Welcome to the Minetti Shrum Museum. My name is Allie, and I'm a visitor student staffer. Before we begin today's program, we should take a moment to acknowledge the land which UC Davis sits. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of the Putwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Putwin tribes, Kachil Dihi, Band of the Wintun Indians of the Calusa Indian Community, Kletzel Dihi, Wintun Nation, and Yoka Dihi, Wintun Nation. The Putwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for coming. I'd like to extend a warm welcome on behalf of the students, faculty, and staff of the Department of Art and Art History. My name is Philip Byrne, and I'm a second year graduate student in Art Studio. Before we begin, we'd like to thank Jan Schrem and Maria Minetti Schrem for their extraordinary support of the arts at UC Davis, of which the California Studio is but one part. We'd also like to thank Dean Atakawana for her enthusiastic support and everyone at the Minetti Shrem Museum for their co-sponsorship hosting this lecture. The California Studios visiting artists have deeply enriched my own experience as a graduate student. And today, it is my immense pleasure to introduce the spring quarter teaching artist in residence, Beatriz Cortez. Beatriz Cortez is a multidisciplinary artist whose work explores simultaneity, life in different temporalities, and different versions of modernity. Cortez received her MFA from the California Institute of the Arts and holds a PhD in Literature and Cultural Studies from Arizona State University. She teaches in the Department of Central American and Transborder Studies at California State University, Northridge, and her work is currently on view at the Institute of Contemporary Art, San Diego North, and the Smithsonian Art and Industries Building. She is a visionary artist whose work imagines new and possible futures and is a rare and remarkable influence in contemporary art and cultural studies. We are thrilled to have her here for a second time. Please join me in welcoming Beatriz Cortez. Thank you so much, um, Philip, for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm going to read to make sure that I don't take too much time. Um, I want to begin by expressing my gratitude to the California Studio Teaching Artists in Residence program here at UC Davis. I am honored to have been chosen for this award by the Faculty in Visual Arts and I am grateful to be here. It is my first time teaching in person since the start of the pandemic, making it extra special for me to get to spend time speaking about art with all of you. And I also want to thank some of the faculty in a special way, Graham McDougall, who was the first person to invite me for a lecture here at UC Davis at the start of the pandemic. As it turned out, we had to cancel my flight and uh, hold a virtual event, but it was lovely to continue to hold these conversations as an antidote to our isolation. Annabeth Rosen, the chair of the studio section, has been so generous with her guidance and time as I prepare to move here and to start teaching. Also, Robin Hill, thank you for the warm welcome. The artists in the MFA Studio program, they are so much fun to work with and they also give the best welcome parties. I'm very much looking forward to starting um, a series of studio visits that I am going to start tomorrow and in the weeks to come. And I want to thank um, Katie Groby for smoothly sorting um, everything out for the California Studio artists. I feel so fortunate to have your support, but also your interest in my work and my practice. And of course, thank you all for being here. Thank you so much to everyone at the museum for, um, for welcoming me and um, 
doing all this extra work trying to help me install a sculpture for you that I have for later for you. Today, um, so special thanks um, to Susie Cantor, to um, Jeremy Hollis, to Melanie um, Cook, 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 and um, to everyone in the staff because I will I will just butcher their names. And I'm really sorry, but anyway, I just met all of you and you have been so kind and I am really grateful to the Manetti Schramm Endowment for making my presence here possible. Thank you. And hello to my students. Thank you for being here. I wanna begin by telling you a little about my work and some of the concepts that are central to my work, time, simultaneity and movement. And through my work, I explore how issues of such as race, class, gender, or migration intercept or cut through these concepts. Time has become a central concept in my work, particularly in my effort to break chronologies, which are Darwinian and support the idea that there is a past that was backward and that there is a future that moves towards progress. On the one hand, my work is about the experiences of simultaneity, being into different time frames, living in two places at once in Salvador and Los Angeles, existing in two or more but different versions of modernity, in different cultural worldviews, moving back and forth, within different technologies, languages, experiences of climate on Earth, relationships to objects and plants and animals. More importantly, my work is about movement and because of it, it is about the future. I build memory so I can imagine possible futures. And so for my presentation today, I would like to Tom to talk about some of the ideas that inform these works that I have been making during the time since my last lecture, and some of the works that I'm envisioning for the future if we have time to do that. And how I'm striving to collapse time, to break chronologies, to generate a conversation through my work of ancient and contemporary thinkers who are in many ways exploring similar concepts. This conversation, out of whack with time and technologies is what I call an untimely conversation. How to inhabit a life in a world that is subterranean? How to collapse chronologies? Those are some of my tasks, and I would like to speak of a few of the projects that I have been working on recently and that follow these threads. Let me begin by talking about the construction of a sculpture titled Glacial Erratic. The proposal for this sculpture received the Freeze Life Water Prize in 2020, and it was shown that year in New York at Rockefeller Center after being canceled and then reprogrammed for September. It was inspired by glacial erratic rocks like this one that you see here that are in Central Park. During the last ice age, the melting ice opened groves on the Manhattan bedrock and also deposited numerous glacial erratics all over the landscape, and these large masses of rock that look different in size and shape from the rocks that are in the local landscape are quite remarkable. They're so large. Children play there all the time. People have picnics on them. And they're visible all over the city. They're in Central Park, but also in Prospect Park, in Battle Hill, in the Bronx, and in the northern part um, of the island, and so many other sites all over the city. The matter that forms these rocks documents their migration before the human era, as well as the moment in which they emerged from under the ice cap cover. As they were exposed to the light and to cosmic rays, the erratics were also touched by rad radiation, generating a process that documents their migration and the passing of time. The sculpture, made of steel, evokes an erratic as it invites the viewer to consider the long counts of time that are marked by the motions of the planet, the planetary nature of ancient migration, as well as the ways in which matter is marked by its placement and its interaction with the world around it. Placing the work at Rockefeller Center was an invitation to imagine climate chaos, especially because the steel was unsealed and kept changing daily um, during this time. There's a lot of rain in New York. And so it allowed people to imagine ancient migrations, the crumbling of modernities, um, global warming all at once. Later on, 
I had the opportunity to move glacial erratic to what is now the ICA San Diego, where it resides permanently. But when it arrived, it was part of a collaboration that I had envisioned with other artists, Candice Lynn, Rafa Esparza, Kang Song Lee, Pavitra Prasad, and Christian Tedeschi. The title of the exhibition is a glyph which represents the mountain. It evokes a snake of massive proportions that moves under the surface of the earth and in sacred subterranean worlds at a speed that is barely perceived by humans, but that transforms and shapes the land. As it moves, this snake exposes curved sections of its monumental body, forming the mountains in the horizon. The ancient glyph that captures this concept was carved in stone and drawn in multiple um, codices that evoke what the Aztec voice um, uttered as tepeto, the Maya as wit, what in English is mountain, what in Spanish is cerro. The glyph was read in different languages across what is now Mesoamerica and Central Mexico. In all, the oldest one, the oldest voice that matched this glyph was that of the Olmecs. Unfortunately, we don't know its voice today. Its memory survives only in the ancient stone carvings that Olmec artists made thousands of years ago and in multiple surviving codices of the Teotihuacan peoples and those made by the Toltec, Mixtec, Aztec, Maya artists. As the mountains flow at a rhythm visible only in the long counts of time, people who carry this sacred memory migrate in different directions, at different speeds, and cross the landscape, come together with others, and create like other artists did before them in the brevity of one human lifetime or the fleeting moments set by the short counts of time in this landscape, and at each moment, the different temporalities and the different paths come together. But going back in time a little bit, as we made Glacial Erratic in my studio, two Los Angeles-based artists, Rafa Esparza and Castles, began fundraising and organizing a coalition of 80 artists and a major enterprise to write messages in the sky, messages meant to reveal that there are concentration camps, that immigrants are held indefinitely in detention centers, that families in our communities are separated, and that these centers are for profit. It was a complex project that involved numerous community organizations fighting for immigrant rights and that was meant to support them, to make their work visible. It included artists in different states, including California, Arizona, Texas, Louisiana, Georgia, Washington, DC, Illinois, New York, among others. I participated in this project in three different ways. As an organizer with the help of my friend Douglas, during the months of May and June 2020, we organized a coalition of Central American community organizations that work for immigrant rights, Carecen, Salef, Clinica Romero, Endilon, El Rescate, Maya Vision, and the Central American Research and Policy Institute, CARPI. Holding meetings with them and with Rafa Esparza, the coalition constituted one of the artists in this initiative in plain sight. So I participated in those two ways, but the phrase that we wrote could only have 15 characters because each of the letters is about the size of the Empire State Building. And each of the phrases can be seen approximately about 20 miles in radius, so by millions of people each time. I had a hard time deciding what to write I wanted to educate the general public to denounce the immigration detention centers, the separation of families, the children being robbed of their childhood, but I also wanted to send a message of hope to immigrants who are detained and who are not allowed to speak to even a lawyer or to others who were crossing or to others who were struggling. I wanted, like in ancient times, to communicate through the sky, through smoky puffs, this made me excited. I thought it was an ancient practice and a contemporary practice at once, and I realized that not only, as the Los and Gatari say, the sky has been diagrammed by radars and flying paths, but also that the sky has become corporate, 
that the messages in the sky are about selling us stuff, not about our people, that they are not in our languages, that they don't have our content. The work of In Plain Sight was powerful in this regard. I love reading all the artist's messages. It is not your fault. Stop crimigration now. Care, not cages. No eyes, no eyes, no eyes. La frontera nos cruzó. Te quiero mucho, mi cielo. Chinga tu migra, and many more. Together, we were able to say all those things with lots of characters. My message in the sky was written over the skies in downtown Los Angeles, over the immigration court, and it read, no cages, no jaulas. I chose this phrase because our communities have, have suffered from one of the most despicable acts, the separation of children from their families, our children being held in refrigerated cages surrounded by chain link, covering their bodies with mylar blankets, growing up alone, feeling abandoned, without being able to satisfy their most basic needs physically and spiritually. They need to be released to their families who love them and miss them and to their communities so that we can be made whole again and so that they may heal. The coalition of Central American community organizations decided to write their message over the border. Close to Texas and in Maya Kiche, it said, Makaka Sheikh Takib which means we will not be afraid. It was an invitation to imagine a safe future for indigenous people from Central America and Mexico and for all. The use of this language was a statement of the survival of Maya peoples, particularly the Quiche, who are the majority of the indigenous immigrants from Central America in Los Angeles and in the United States. I am sure that many of you, many of them, work here in the fields, writing in this language with smoke on the sky evokes the smoke rituals to communicate with the gods that were recorded in the Popol Vuh, the ancient sacred text of the Maya Quiche. In addition, Nancy Baker Cahill, an artist who designed the fourth wall up to place artworks in augmented reality, and Yong Chong, who took this video from Commonwealth and Council, installed this phrase over the lake in MacArthur Park, where it resides today. Through this permanent work of augmented reality, Central American people got something that the city of Los Angeles never gave us, a permanent recognition of our presence in the city after all these decades. Makaka Sheikh Takib. Together with the community organizations, let's see, excuse me, but now how do I get out from this video? Let's go back. Together with the community organizations and my participation in um, in another intervention, we also wrote a message on the ground that could be read from the skies. As usual, undocumented, all the permits were denied to us, so we took the street without permits and wrote our message with chalk in huge colorful letters, defund ICE. This intervention on the ground that accompanied the sky typing took place next to MacArthur Park, a symbolic space for our community. The phrase was accompanied by two guipalas, two ancient flags that symbolize the indigenous presence in the Americas, in this case, the diversity among Central Americans. It was moving to see young and old members of the community from different countries of origin speaking different languages, people of different races all playing together with chalk on the street, it was beautiful to get out of the isolation that we were in by spending the day together, surrounded by the music of a marimba from our community. All of us playing while writing a serious message. People came, people from the organizations, but also people from the communities, from the neighbors that were looking at us, allies from many different groups, people working in the coffee shops around the park, 
backgrounds, different backgrounds, different walks of life. It was beautiful to contribute to amplify the messages of these organizations that have been working for immigrant rights in Los Angeles for four decades. To educate people about the historic reasons for the immigration of Central American peoples to this country and to denounce the lack of a path to legalization, to plead for the reunification of families. Shortly after this moment, I participated in a, in a male art initiative that, that was titled Queer Correspondence, which is also based on this idea about generosity towards a collective unknown other or an untimely conversation. In my case, I collaborated with my friend, also Los Angeles-based artist Kang Song Lee, who's from South Korea, and we um, sent little prints from a machine that had desires for the future in different languages, two posters, one made by Kang and one made by me, two postcards, one made by each of us, and uh, mailed it to people. So you can see some of the things that people received. We wrote letters to each other and sent them to 650 recipients in text form and in postcards with his drawings. Some of the reflections that I included in my letters are about the term queer and queerness understood as horizon, to borrow the words of Jose Esteban Munoz that is understood as future. I love his invitation for us to continue to invent our identities. Queerness, what we will really know as queerness, does not exist yet, he says. In this way, rather than a rigid identity, queerness is imagined as a way to dismantle the patriarchal structure and the gender binaries that are tied to humanism, but also as a way to imagine a more diverse we. Writing those letters, I was able to consider identity politics, the intersectionality of multiple identities in the making, always in the flow towards the future. This was particularly important for me as, a br as brown and black people were at greater risk of dying and are dying in prisons and immigration detention centers. The pandemic brought about discussions about breathing, healthcare rights, human rights, immigrant rights, the rights of communities of color, when George Floyd was murdered and rage and anger took our communities out of quarantine and into the streets. For long, I had been thinking about breathing as a way to question possibilities of white supremacy, breathing as a way to move beyond the space of our bodies. Sending these packages in the mail allowed us to have these conversations with many others who received them days later and posted posted about them, responded, wrote back, etc. As you can see, my talk today is about time travel and the concept of the untimely, which is about imagining a conversation happening with other realities and other possible presence, other possible past. But first, let me talk for a moment about the concept of the untimely a little bit, because I want to go back to it and um, digest it a little Maybe it was Nietzsche who said that he was untimely, not that there was a concept of the untimely, but that he belonged to another time. Or maybe it was Peter Osborne who questioned who's our contemporary that, and made me imagine a group of people who spoke my same language, many of them philosophers and artists, many of them living in different time periods or different spaces. Many of them have never met me and I have never met them, but they and their words allow us to form a community through space and time as they pop up in my mind while I go about doing my daily tasks. They have become some sort of my imaginary friends, my contemporaries. They help me make sense of uncharted territories. This concept of the untimely, I'm going to run through some slides here to get to uh, let's see. I have a feeling, excuse me, but I have a feeling that I, um, when I exited this, I, um, I added, I, I, I am, I'm playing the wrong thing. Okay, there we go. 
This concept of the untimely came to my world, and not only through the work of philosophers from the past, but also through the conceptual worldviews of indigenous peoples from the present. I am fortunate that I have been collaborating with a Cachiquel collective in the town of Patricia in Guatemala that dedicates itself to the construction of memory, the memory of their dead, the memory of their town, and the memory of their ancestors. I have known them for about 15 years now, and we have collaborated on several projects together. One particular project was a book that collected their ideas, their photographs and objects, and included my reflections about our collaboration and their work on memory. This book titled Cajai includes an essay authored by the Cachiquel Research Collective or Colectivo Cachiquel de Investigaciones about ancient objects. In the story of creation preserved in the Popol Vuh, which is the sacred book of the Maya Quiche, the objects that were not treated well by the humans of their era rebelled. Hablaron todas sus tinajas, all of the jars spoke, sus comales, they, their clay griddles, sus platos, their plates, sus ollas, their pots, su nixtamal, their nixtamal, Las piedras, the stones, los tenemastes que estaban en el fuego, se lanzaron con ímpetu a sus cabezas. The cooking stones that were over the fire threw themselves with all their might over their heads. Les hicieron daño. They hurt them. Desesperados, desperate, corrían apresurados. They ran away hurriedly. Querían subir sobre las casas. They wanted to climb over their houses. Pero las casas se desmoronaban y ellos caían, but the houses crumbled and they would fall. Querían subir sobre los árboles. They wanted to climb over the trees y los árboles los rechazaban and the trees rejected them. Querían entrar en las cuevas y las cuevas se cerraban ante ellos. They wanted to enter the caves and the caves would close in in front of them. In a similar manner, the Cachiquel Research Collective explains in their text titled Objeto Antiguo or Ancient Object that ancient objects have a peculiar characteristic that makes them reveal themselves or to hide from people. They possess kush, which can be translated as a soul, a center, an essence, a heart. In other words, and I quote, it is the vital energy that all beings possess, human or not, end of quote. One of the arguments presented in this essay that they wrote is that through the daily coexistence and the quotidian use of ancient objects, people in the community are, are able to form what I imagine as an untimely community with their ancestors. The authors provide us some examples. Don Julian was digging a well and he found a large stone that later was used as an altar by the people in the community. And some visitors, researchers have conducted studies of this object and have called it altar one. Don Gavino found two carved stones in the shape of animals. He transported them to his house and decorated them. And he placed them in his patio under a lemon tree. He based them regularly. Don Toribio found a jade figure, and with it, he made a necklace. He added the image of a Catholic religious figure. Don Victoriano thinks that one must not remove the dirt from the ancient objects because it is part of their memory, and with it, they look better. Don Fermin has been lucky to find several stone objects in his land, and he has collected them and placed them in his garden and in other spaces in his home. End of quote. Through the daily coexistence, the Cachiquel Research Collective reached some points that are parallel to what Karen Barad ha has argued is the entanglement of matter, or what other scholars have argued about the vibrancy of matter from perspectives linked to philosophy or quantum mechanics. The objects are beings, they have wills, they decide when to show themselves and when to hide, they rebel and can punish or they can protect. In order to coexist in community with the objects, the authors explain that what is needed is respect. By this, they mean that respect for ancient traditions is required in order for the objects to reveal themselves. 
in all of their meanings and to function as portals for the formation of untimely communities with the ancestors. In the absence of such respect, the objects become merely archeological artifacts subjected to a realm that is no longer communal, but a university realm, an academic realm, or the realm of the state, end of quote. However, within the community, these objects retain their powers to form communities across time and across space with the ancestors. They function as time machines. As the Kakchikel Research Collective argues, the objects embedded onto daily life in the community also pose questions about the different ways to engage with objects, especially outside the academic realm of archaeology which would call them artifacts. During the pandemic, our collective formed by Cajai, who were at the time one in Brazil, studying in Manaus, two in Patricia in Guatemala, in their town, and Fiebre, made up uh, by two young artists based in Mexico City, and myself joining them from Los Angeles, our collective spread across the Americas, met every Tuesday for months and months we love the fact that we were spread across the Americas. We love the fact that we were talking through Zoom. And we began creating together, and that opened up many possibilities of collaboration and to imagine collective subjects of the past, present, and future. My tactical friends work in collective ways, so our decision-making moved at a very slow, slow pace. And it was important and a great privilege to spend each Tuesday afternoon together for hours shaping our collaboration and making work as we debated if calling it art was an act of colonialism, if objects made by a sculptor have kush, and as we engage with the idea that what emerges from under the earth has a will. The, the altar, by the way, looks like this now which is very different to the way it looked when I visited it years ago. The, their way of understanding the underworld re reminded me of a class lecture by Deleuze that was published without, permi uh, without permission in um, Editorial Cactus in Argentina, and that's how I was able to read it. It's, it spoke of metal workers, where he says that when a metal worker opens up a hole on the ground, the hole is not leading us to an emptiness. There's another world there, he said. Another reality pours out of that hole. That hole leads to simultaneity. One story that Ishmukane told us during one of the meetings impacted me in a particular way. She said that when she was younger, before she started studying to become an archaeologist, Barely starting her studies at the university, she heard about a great ancient stone that was in the house of a family in Patricia. So she went to that house and she knocked on the door and she said that she was coming to see the stone. Sure, come in, they said. But when she entered, the stone that was shown to her was not the one that she had been told about. And so, like this, it happened with many other houses. She kept knocking on the doors. They said, sure, and they would show her a stone, and it was a different one. In other words, in Patricia and its surroundings, many Kachikel families coexist with ancient stones. They are part of their daily way of seeing the world, of their daily conversations, and even, I imagine, of the memories that Kachikel migrants carry with them. I was impacted by the creation of these cabawiles or the lords of the mountain that Eddie carried out because he, who had joined our conversations from Brazil where he was studying for his doctorate in anthropology, imagined a portable altar or a stone amulet that could protect him. And this made me think about the migrating stones, the glacial erratic, and through them I also thought about migrant al migrating altars. But I also thought about Edgar Esquit a renowned interdisciplinary intellectual whose work has influenced not only many youth in Patricia, but also his colleagues at the University of San Carlos and outside of Guatemala, just like his work has impacted me and my colleagues 
and my students here in California, I thought about how important it is that he now dreamt about creating with his hands and that he imagined a small mushroom for the altar of a farmer that was also himself. And our conversations made me think of many Edgars coexisting in collectivity and simultaneity across time and space. Here you see Tonio in Mexico, Eddie, Carla in Mexico, Edgar in Patricia, and Ishmukane in Patricia. It is important to know that this is not a collaboration that happens between Guatemala, Mexico, and the United States because the life of these nations has been brief and the ideas that informed the collaboration are much older, especially the idea that an ancient object can allow someone to cross time and space and form communities with ancestors. But in the, in the pandemic, it also allowed us to form a community with others known and unknown in this temporality where the objects now are, but are, but also in other spaces, they are, Spaces that don't belong within the logic of capitalism and are, are not part of modern ideas such as liberalism or imperialism. These spaces are also indigenous territory. They are linked to the ancient past, to an indigenous understanding of time and spirituality. To create and move these objects across territories that are also indigenous contributes to decolonize these spaces, to think them across time and to imagine them with other futures. I want to also tell you about the creation of the altar. Each one of the works in this exhibition is, a col is of collective authorship because it was thought or conceived by all six of us in dialogue. To create the altar for me was to think of the ancestors, of the power of the altar in Patricia that thanks to my friends in Cajay, I was able to visit inside Don Julian's house many years ago. Without them, I wouldn't have been welcome. To make the altar required for me to think in the ways ancestors drew, abstracted, codified, communicated, but it was also an effort to engage with the, pep, with the paper altar created through our collaborations with Fiebre, their own visit to Patricia, their photographs and collages made by Tonio on the maquettes, made by Carla, the two artists who are part of Fiebre. It also required to think of steel as an organic material that emerges from the earth, that is part of the extractive process that is killing the planet. To turn it, a paper altar is to make it light, to allow it to travel through the cosmos populated by satellites and through computer codes towards the working table of many. And to turn it as steel, paper, uh, a steel stone altar, is the contrary gesture to extraction. It is to return it to the earth, to return it to being stone, but it is also an altar for the future. I want to also tell you about my work, Chultun El Semillero. It is a space capsule, carved rock that preserves ancient technologies and knowledge. It is a space capsule for plants and seeds. It is currently on view at a show called Futures at the Smithsonian Arts and Industry Building in DC. In ancient times, inspired by a series of subterranean pools called cenotes, the ancient Maya in the lower Yucatan Peninsula carved hundreds of underground ground spaces in the stone foundation. These subterranean spaces, known as chultunes, served as storage containers for water, food, seeds, and other precious materials. For this installation, I tried to do something impossible, to remove a chultun from under the ground, to imagine the exterior wall of the chultun, to build a speculative underground chultun, imagined simultaneously as a carved space under the ground and as a traveling space capsule, preserving ancient seeds in orbit for the humans of the future. The work invites us to speculate about the best way to preserve viable seeds, the idea that planting the seeds, nurturing them, and cultivating the plants is the best way to maintain viable seeds across generations and to preserve them instead of having them in a vault in a so-called sea bank. Their names could be preserved too. Their cultural meaning could be preserved too for the future. One of the lessons that these seeds contain is that life is only possible through cosmic inter interspecies collaborations and through the sustained care of many generations of different species working to preserve, 
reproduce the atmosphere, the environment, the earth. Preserved as they are in this safe capsule, a problem emerges. What is their destiny? Who will benefit from these seeds? How will they be distributed in the future? Made in these times of pandemic and impacted by the discussions about distribution of um, distribution plans for the vaccine, Chultuna El Semillero also invites us to consider who has access to these resources and how they might be distributed in the future. In the interior of the structure, there is a message carved on a stone that you see um, in the center of the inner circle. For this section, I collaborated with my brother, Ricardo, who is a mathematician. He's a math professor at Tulane University. And it is a message encapsulated in a formula containing the directions for the distribution of seeds for the humans of the future. And I made this a little collage just so that you can see this formula and imagine it. And more or less, it's, um, it's saying over here, this is the symbol of a seed from codices. And so a seed can die. This is a skull. A seed can produce a plant. This is a plant. A plant can produce more seeds you have this loop, or a plant can die. A plant can be used for collective reasons and then it can produce a crop. A crop can produce memory. Memory and also accounting, which was one of the favorite things for the Maya, counting things. So counting things made of corn and the establishment of the site of the cornfields. Drawing from the writings of Emanuele Coccia, particularly his work, The Life of Plants and Metaphysics of Mixture, I consider plants as the lungs through which an atmosphere emerged, what Coccia called the essence of cosmic fluidity, the deepest space of our world, the one that reveals it as the infinite mixture of all things past, present, and future. From his perspective to breathe, is to embrace in one's own breath all the matter of the world. For Kocha, plants, plant leaves are a climatic laboratory for excellence, the oven that produces and frees it into space, the element that renders possible the life, the presence and the mixture of an infinite variety of subjects, bodies, histories, and worldly beings. We know this much is true because of the pandemic. Reading Kocha, I began to think about plants and their cosmic mission of pushing further and becoming for the present, past and the future of the planet. For me, this confirmed the porosity of all bodies and reminded me that it would be not only the stones, the sedimentation layers on the planet as Colebrook had invited me to imagine in her writing about the death of the post-human and the end of the Anthropocene, but also plants that would preserve the memory of the Anthropocene and would circulate that memory, its physicality and fluidity through a becoming that would extend beyond the human era. Plants are survivors of repression, prohibition, colonization, slavery, capitalism, imperialism, eugenics, genetic experimentation. They have survived reminding us of the porosity of their bodies and the fluidity of borders. As Karen Barad explores in her work about the queer nature of atoms, or as Kocha argues when writing about the mixture of matter in the atmosphere. The atmosphere becomes then a communal space that holds intergenerational memories and makes coexistence in multiple temporalities possible. In the sculpture titled After Kocha's Line, The Infinite Mixture of All Things Past, Present, and Future, I I attempted to combine all these ideas about simultaneity contained in the motion of gears and all these ideas about recirculating air, but then later that was no longer necessary because of the pandemic. And it was easily, we could easily perceive um, that we're sharing the air that we breathe. But I would like to finish this presentation with an idea that engages with Colbrook's machine, geologists of the future, reading the sedimentation layers and the remnants of the Anthropocene. I began to ask myself, why wait? Why wait for, some, for the end of the Anthropocene? Why wait for some geologist machine of the future to read the sedimentation layers of our passing through the earth? 
And I decided to become that explorer, that geologist, and to move through the world in search of other lives, but particularly as the pandemic began, in search for a volcano, Ilopango. This stella is called Ilopango Stella B. Ilopango was a volcano that disappeared from the landscape of what is now El Salvador on a day that is estimated as the year 536 AD. This year, or approximately that year, this large stratospheric volcano of an estimated height of 6,000 meters erupted. At the site of the eruption, a caldera filled with water created a beautiful lake, Lake Ilopango. Lake Ilopango is at the center of one of the most beautiful landscapes of El Salvador today. However, at the time of this massive volcanic eruption, it was a landscape of death. The consequences for humans, for plants and animals were severe. The devastation produced by the eruption stopped the artistic production of the Maya classical period in the region. The survivors had to migrate to other regions. The whole area was abandoned for almost two centuries. The eruption also impacted other regions in different continents. Particles of the volcanic eruption disseminated across the atmosphere, blocking the sun for several months and eventually falling on different landscapes around the planet. Some of these particles have been found in large urban centers such as Mexico City. In other cases, they were preserved under a layer of glacial ice in Greenland, in the Arctic, and in Antarctica. Further, I plan to ex uh, explore um, this um, eruption of the volcano in lots of different ways. My plan is to go to the Arctic. My plan is to make a speculative volcano. My plan is to engage with it in so many different ways. But I also want to explore the documents. After all, I am also a scholar that works with literature, and I want to search for possible records and evidence of this volcanic eruption in other parts of the world. The year 536 had a never-ending winter globally, and, and several articles have been published recently about this. A cloud of volcanic particles darkened the sun in the northern hemisphere, generating the worst climatic disaster in recorded times. According to a variety of scholars, crops were lost and temperatures dropped, as was documented by the reduced size of the tree rings of that and the following year. The symptoms of a new disease spread. It was the beginning of the first documented epidemic known as the Justinian plague because it took place during the reign of the Roman emperor Justinian. The illness devastated Constantinople. It is estimated that 10 million people died in the Roman Empire alone. More than one fourth of the world's population perished. In his chronicle, Michael the Syrian, a bishop writing in the 12th century, in other words, many, many years later, recorded the memory of this event that probably had been passed orally through different generations. And he wrote, the sun became dark and its darkness lasted for one and a half years. That is 18 months. Each day it shone for about four hours. And it's still, this light was only a feeble shadow. Everyone declared that the sun would never recover its original light. Roman Empire historian Procopius wrote, the sun gave forth its light without brightness, like the moon during the whole year. And it seemed exceedingly like the sun in eclipse for the beams it shed were not clear, not such as it is accustomed to shed. In Italy, Cassiodoro stated, we have had a winter without storms, spring without mildness, summer without heat. In Mesopotamia, large numbers of birds perished. Constantinople was devastated by famine. And in some parts of China, snow fell during the summer months. I am interested in exploring speculative ideas that emerge when one considers that the Tierra Blanca Joven, or the ashes that it spread, was disseminated across the globe by the eruption of the Ilopango volcano. There is sacred and has spiritual meaning to the people who have migrated and continue to migrate from Central American region to other landscapes that might be foreign, but also contain particles of 
not only Mesoamerican soil, but the underworld, the Mesoamerican sacred underworld, this Tierra Blanca joven. My objective in searching cultural and historical documents that might illuminate us on this impact of the volcanic eruption is to imagine the cultural and conceptual impact of the migrations on the planet, on humans, on plants and animals. And so I am in search of that. But finally, I wanna finish this presentation and return to the concept of the untimely conversation to invite you to press a button and get a printed ticket from the box of untimely conversations, um, which I installed for you here today, inspired by the Posthuman, a book by Rosie Braidotti that we're reading with my students in the seminar, Imaginaries of the Future, and what we will be discussing next Tuesday, and her ideas about death and becoming. This work invites you to be part of an untimely conversation with others who are not in the same temporality or space as we are here and now. I hope you enjoy the quotes about death and becoming from some of my favorite thinkers. And thank you very much again for your attention to this talk. Thank you. If um, any of you have questions, I would be happy to answer them. And you can also get up and interact with the box if, if you want. Raise your hand if you have a question. I'll bring the mic to you. Okay. Hello, hello. Um, no, nada más quería agradecerle eh, de parte de quizás como un estudiante y este... Creo que muchos de los de la gente latina acá no tiene muchos modelos a quien seguir y también pues creo que está creando usted un discurso este o abriendo camino a muchos discursos que tenemos mucho deseo contribuir pero no muchos modelos entonces sí muchas gracias no por el contrario muchas gracias por estar aquí tal vez platicamos más tarde más me encantaría any other questions or alguna otra pregunta? Or comentario? Or a comment? Is that Chloe? No. Oh. <laughs> um, but yeah. do you ever uh, worry about like your safety after doing a social piece? And how um, do you get the um, approval or like go about actually like um creating something in the sky or like um, on the streets like how do you what safety measures or like what's the process like for that no i think that you just need to hire a fleet of planes and whoever can afford that can ride whatever they want in the skies and that's um at this moment the law so um we just raised the well rafa and castles raised the funds and invited 80 artists, some of them coalitions and some of them artists, um, to write whatever we wanted in the sky. I know I don't worry about my safety because I am, I have always been, I mean, I have been a professor of Central American and Transborder Studies for 22 years. I, this is what I do. I talk about these things every day. And um, I am an immigrant from El Salvador and um, I'm just talking about my life. Thank you for the question. Beatrice, Beatrice, I Hi, feel Annabelle. like I, I feel like I've just lived through two thousand years <laughs> of history, and I'm you know, struggling to keep the threads. Um, I have so many questions to ask. Um, one of the things you mentioned is about, um, and maybe simplistic, um, about um, the soul of objects that you make, if that can, if that exists, and if you could talk about that. And one of the other things I wanted to um, just comment on was the, how it reminds me of my friends who I grew up with 
maybe in different countries, who just believe in another world, in ghosts, in UFOs. Uh, the, you know, it's not a question that the dead are with us or, you know, things that we don't commonly embrace. And I feel like the, the, the lecture and the things you talk about, this kind of like a seamlessness in your research and in your work that goes to the real and the unreal, the speculative, the known and the unknown, the dead and the living, the ancient and the contemporary. And um, I, it's just amazing to keep all those thoughts up and going at the same time. And um, I don't really even know what my question is. I'm just hoping we can go for coffee. But um, <laughs> I guess uh, if you could talk about the soul of objects that really um, kind of uh, tap my imagination about. Annabeth, is this a trick question? <laughs> I'm going to try to answer. I'm because not there's so many that. parts. But I, I, w I think let's go to the, um, to the objects. I guess I'm trying to counter Western reason, which would say that whatever we don't scientifically demonstrate with the science that we have in the Western world, because scientists, and my brother's a scientist, and my brother would say that he, he, he can only see what can be demonstrated, but being a mathematician and believing in abstraction and in differential equations, he knows that there's lots of things that we don't see yet that are there. And so he believes in the unknown too. And I love that about scientists because they're always looking for more information to debunk what they already believe was true. And I think when sometimes in the humanities, especially, Sometimes we take for granted what we believe uh, is true or is, reason, is part of reason from a Western perspective. And what I love about um, having been so fortunate to collaborate with my practical friends for so many years has been that they don't take for granted the, the Western reason's findings because they don't have a place there. And even the Western identities are not good enough because they don't want to be part of, of which identity should they be part of? Should they be Guatemalan? Because they are in Guatemala. I am from El Salvador, we're next door, but should they be Guatemalan? Guatemala has never given them any room to exist. Should they be Latino? They don't want to be Latino. They, they want to be indigenous and they want their beliefs to um, speak um, tete -a -tete with everything else. And I think what's really beautiful is that when um, speculative philosophers began to question Western reason, their arguments ended up encountering indigenous peoples in my my belief is that in many ways that didn't happen by chance because, for example, someone like Deleuze was really good friends with Pierre, Pierre Clastre who was working in Paraguay and who wrote societies against the state and uh, about the Guaymi people and he wrote about how the Guaymi people had a different kind of law that wasn't modern law that was inscribed on the body and tattooed on the body or scarred onto the body, etc. And I think the writings of Pierre Clastres really brought um, the laws to think about indigenous peoples in the Americas because a lot of the ideas about the war machine, etc., in my opinion, come from indigenous peoples in the Americas. And so I don't think it's by chance that these there's these two critiques of moder modern thought or liberalism or um, Western reason that end up encountering themselves. And so people who are speculative philosophers say that matter is vibrant because, because matter is made of self-organizing molecules. And indigenous people say matter is intelligent and it has a soul and it decides when to reveal itself. And if you have something, you're lucky because that object chose you. And if that object doesn't want you, 
It will, it won't, it will fall from your hands. It will make you trip. It will always disappear. And so, there's something really beautiful about the willingness to accept that there's another reason or another modernity that isn't the Western one that may be true and that has scientific foundations um, without a doubt. And so that that possibility excites me. And I guess. Um, that's the best way that I can answer this question because it's an enormous question that even in my daily practice, I'm not sure that I always am able to follow through and look at all the objects as objects that have a life, but I try. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the question. There's another question behind you. Oh, did you still have a question? Sorry, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, thank you for everything. This is so beautiful. But um, thank you. I guess, like, my question, because I'm doubling with Art Studio and Estudios Chicanos, um, and I don't know, I've had, like, a lot of, like, conflict in, like, trying to, like, because I think both of these, like, majors can connect, like, really well, but at the same time, there's, like, a lot of conflict in the sense of, like, how do we engage in work that's constantly... Um, engage in what? And how do we engage in like work? Like I guess like activism, um, whatever you know you're doing, like that's in like constant practices. And um, I know that artwork can like do a lot of that. And so it was like really interesting, but, like really beautiful getting to see like your you know like <laughs> I guess like journey through the work that you make and how like um, I guess like you're doing both at the same time, like you're involving some sort of like social praxis that's kind of questioning, you know, like what's uh, what's like the appropriate way to like see, I guess, like change. Um, but I don't know, I guess like my question is, is like how, where did you feel like, or do you feel like you, you like tend to like separate like the social practices and your art, or are they like working together at the same time? So, like the example, you know, of like making like the collaborative efforts to like do the the um, I guess señales over, you know, like the ISIS detention centers. Um, I think that's like a perfect example of how like you're making like work to like you know do that. But um, like, do you feel like they have to be separate, or are they not separate? Like, <laughs> what's your well? It's a really good question. I, I frankly, thank you for the question. I frankly don't um, see my work or my practice as social practice. I consider that offensive because, but not from, I'm just not saying that you're offending me, but I, offensive to the, in the gesture of trying to demote the art and call it social practice. This is art and this is social practice. I just make art. I, I don't make anything else, but, um, that being said, that question emerges in my mind all the time, the question that you're asking exactly because, because I think that what's really important um, for me is that my work is made with a mixture of steel and plants and seeds and philosophy. And it's highly conceptual, and at the same time, it's of this world, and it's talking about things that are real in this world, but it is um, inscribed and engaged in conversations with contemporary art um, all at once. And so it's not that I said one day I'm going to do some work that's going to be about activism or anything like that. I just make work about the things that I'm passionate about. And at this moment of the pandemic, this was really important for us, especially because part of the effort in those um, flights, in those sky typing um, messages, was to make visible the fact that there's a lot of centers that are for profit, that are holding immigrants detained indefinitely, and that are really close to urban centers. Like, for example, there's one in the middle of Brooklyn, and people don't know about it. And so that people could know that next to Ikea, there's a detention center that somebody's making $750 per immigrant per day. And so that people know that there's a detention center very close to 
Los Angeles, Adelanto, by Victorville, and uh, there's all these immigrants detained there and that they are not given the right to speak to a lawyer. And we thought people don't know that. But if you try to educate people in a traditional way, we might not do it. And so um, speaking through the sky allowed us for all these other dimensions that enter into the realm of contemporary art and that have content that is philosophical and conceptual and therefore allow for other types of reflections for people to see these messages and think about them and figure them out years later, etc. And it also is something that appears in the sky and about five seconds later it's gone. And so it's bleeding, um, etc. So I, I think um, because of that, each one of the actions required so many meetings because we were thinking about all these things so that our work would um, stand and, and engage with other works. But at this, and, and there are other artists that we can think about who have written in the sky and who were not called social practice artists because they were not from El Salvador or were men, but we know them, right? So therefore, it's really important to for me to stand my ground and to say that I make art only. Um, at the same time, I also wanted to, to, to add something that, um, well, regarding the, the, the work, the idea of the social practice, I just wanted to tell you a story. One time, there was a really famous meeting that everyone knows about where a group of artists, um, that are really good friends now met for the first time because they were all invited to a museum in Los Angeles. And they showed up to the meeting and they said, so why are we here and what's going on? Oh, we, we selected the artists that do social practice and we invited you. And so, um, you know, the, the museum also was in for a surprise to learn that day that you don't get to decide how to define the artists. The artists will define themselves and so, they were like, what? We're, we do social practice, that's who we are, really? Um, but they met each other and they went out for noodles and um, became friends forever. <laughs> um, any other questions? Hi, thank you for, uh, for covering so much. I'm still sort of processing this, but I was struck by your use of steel and wondering, uh, you know, this is sort of a rudimentary <laughs> attitude maybe, but I was saying, well, you're doing things with steel that might have been done in stone. And uh, how did you get into working with that sort of fabrication and the materials? Yes, it's a really good question. I didn't get a chance to talk about it much, but um, I have the support of a huge community of people who um, helped me prepare the surfaces of the metal that we use in my studio. Um, I, there's an artist in my studio, Tatiana Guerrero, who works with me. She's my right hand and she's amazing. And we build our work together. Now that I'm here, she's in my studio and I'm here. And every night we talk and send each other lots of pictures to see what we're making and designing and we're, we're switching um, from one hand to the other. And her family, my family, her friends, my friends, her boyfriend, my former students, my students, all these people and my best friends, um, they have spaces in their garages, in their homes, in their backyards, where they um, take pieces of, of the sheet metal that we're gonna use for welding that we have already cut and prepared. And they um, beat it with round ball hammers over sacks of sand so that they beat the industrialization out of it so that they function as the rivers and transform the material into organic material so that we can make it stone again and return it to the earth. Please come. Oh. You, Excuse me, I have a comment first. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, I just wanted to say that I was, I'm extremely, uh, thank you first off because this was a beautiful talk and everything that you've shown us was amazing, but I just, there's a something I was noticing within how you discuss what you make and how you exist as an artist is like you, your community is so important in your work, in your making, in your exhibitions and you've almost like, I feel like you're really working towards like decentralizing the idea of a gallery space, of an idea of like only a specific persons can go and see an art piece with the work that you're doing in the sky, with the public works that you're doing. And it's, it's just extremely inspiring to see that. And it, I think gives, I like for the younger generation of art makers, like a lot of hope that we're going away from like the white wall gallery life of, you know, like, the donors' friends are getting their artworks into the museums, and unless you have that connection, it's going to be tougher. And it's just, it, I'm extremely inspired. And I just, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to let you know. Thank you. I, I um, wanted to say that, I mean, I'm very fortunate. I work with an amazing gallery that um, is made of people who really support my practice. They, they don't. If I say, I want to make this work and place it outdoors, they love it and they help me. And sometimes they think this is madness. Somebody can take this work, what are you doing? And they still help me. And this gallery is um, a gallery that, that represents um, artists who are, many of us are women, queer artists, or Korean artists, or Asian artists, or um, Latin American artists, etc. And so in this gallery, Co Commonwealth and Council, um, I, I don't think that there is a preconceived idea of what I should be making. There, there is a conversation and then we make the work and sometimes it is outdoors, which is one of my favorite things. And sometimes when it's indoors, I have taken all my work, which is really heavy and difficult to install, and installed it outdoors before taking it to the gallery so I can see it outdoors, because it's really important to me to imagine the work somewhere in the landscape. And I think that that's why part of the work is about mailing things or writing things that are things that are fleeting and that you can't really know what happened with them. There's something beautiful about that. Thank you for your comment. Hi, Beatrice. Thank you so much for coming. Thank and you. That, thank you for that amazing talk. I'm, I'm so uh, intrigued by that idea of Western material and Western matter conceived of as, as, as different and in, in, uh, in juxtaposition to an in, in, indigenous conception of matter. And I love that. Uh, you're, the section you were talking about, Deleuze, and trying to figure out um, how to articulate and manifest some of that tension and the vibration between these different definitions of what we think we see. And um, so that that's more of a comment, but it, it does relate to the physical material of your steel work. And I was wondering, in terms of matter, do you plan the shape of those large steel structures in in advance and then like as an architectural model and then build it or it comes from the making well it comes from the making and there's a lot of improvisation thank you for that question it's really interesting to think about how the works start taking shape but i do plan things really well it's just that i don't make drawings I, they're in my head but i know exactly where we're going at least till the next step, and then I know again where we're going before we do it, till the next step, and then I have to see that step before I decide the next thing. But um, I, I do sometimes run into trouble, like my students know so well, some of them are here with the angles, and more than once I've, I've had, uh, okay, I have $4,000 of steel that I'm gonna cut, and then I really call my brother and I ask him if I'm cutting it correctly because I don't want to cut it wrong. But for the most part, I 
draw things with chalk on the floor in my studio and then improvise, measure the angles, decide things by eyeballing them, um, improvise a lot of things. But in the case, of, for example, of the large glacial erratic, I had a rock that was from Nayarit, which is a slant for the Mixtec people, the origins of the world, and that rock had been under the water and it had all these uh, streaks that made it look a lot like a glacial erratic, and it was small, and I, I don't know how to say regla de tres, but I did it with regla de tres, so um, you multiply 100 is to whatever, like 30 is to x, and then 30 by whatever, you divide it by 100 is your number, so I, I enlarged it by doing this math calculation on, with chalk on the welding table every day um, for each section and looking at each section that was gonna be inserted in different locations, and then we, we torched the metal with oxyacetylene to try to match my drawing made with that regla de tres calculation. So everything was done very much estimated very freely, but I, but I knew what I wanted the sculpture to look like. Thank you, so helpful. Thank you for the question. There's a couple of questions over here, I guess. Hi. Uh, Beatrice, Hi. thank you so much. What an amazing talk and work. I just wanted to start with thank appreciating uh, the gift you gave us today. My, my question kind of connects and goes back to Annabeth's. Um, I thought your answer was so masterful to bring it back to indigeneity. But I was having some of the same thoughts as Annabeth, but more in terms of like the seed pod, I felt like, I was wondering, did I read that in a Marquez chapter? It it's, has such connections to magical realism. Are you interested in that vein or is it more about these shared scientific principles that's running through your work? No, I love Garcia Marquez and I read all of Garcia Marquez, but I couldn't be more opposed to magical realism than anything else in the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's a really good question. And the reason is because, you know, people who defined magical realism defined it from outside Latin America and basically claiming there's reason and then there's magical realism. So these people don't exist in the realm of reason and I exist in the realm of reason. This is about philosophy and math. And um, that's why I love Garcia Marquez, but I don't think my sculptures um, belong in, 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 what is the name of that world? And I forgot the name of the town. <laughs> what is the name of the town? I forgot right now, but um, I love his writing, obviously, and especially my favorite book is, and, and um, the first one that he wrote is that, uh, it, actually he published it in the newspaper first, but it's the story of um, the, the shipwreck of all these people who were stealing all these washing machines and ended up stranded in, um, in the ocean and were rescued by the beauty queens in Colombia and this guy who had been lost at sea for so many, many, many months eventually showed up and it's a story about um, corruption in Colombia as well, etc. And so it's more of a journalist kind of story, but it's so unbelievable that one could say it sounds like a novel and it's really beautiful and it forced him to leave Colombia and all those histories I love, but, but I think I am absolutely um, more inscribed in, in other types of fiction writing like what I have called aesthetics of cynicism or these very dark um, ways of understanding the world after the utopias of the revolutions have crumbled. More like Roberto Bolaño or Rodrigo Rey Rosa. Those are some of my favorite authors. Thank you for that question. And um, is there any other question? Yes? I 
as you called it, and um, immaterial. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to comment on that just because I thought it was a, you encapsulated that concept very well um, on how it's not just um, a belief, quote unquote, but like scientifically based, just because someone told me something really simple once about 